Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, good Welcome morning. to Hilltop Community Church. We're excited that you're here with us this morning. As uh, you know, weather's beautiful outside, and uh, but there's no greater to be than, than right here worshiping God. And we're excited to be here with our family, and excited to see more people coming back as uh, as things move on. Um, I know that uh, as we move into the next phase here uh, this week, uh, the the government, you know, the, the governor in Indiana. Um, lightening restrictions and moving into the next phase, you know, it uh, it will lighten some of the restrictions. So um, uh, be paying attention to Facebook um, as we start communicating those over the next couple of weeks. But, uh, you know, heading in the right direction um, as a, you know, as a, as a country, as far as, you know, controlling and, and, you know, doing our part, right? And I think this church has been very responsible in doing that. So thank you for that. But we look forward to the point where we can open up fully and have everybody back, right? That each week we've grown in numbers and we continue to, to grow, but uh, be excited to have the, the doors wide open, so to speak, and have uh, have our whole family here with us. So we're excited about that. Um, but between now and then, welcome uh, on Facebook and uh, or YouTube, wherever you're watching it this morning. And uh, excited to have you with us in spirit, um, but uh, look forward to when we can be together again fully. So excited for what God's got on his heart today. Um, as far as other announcements, uh, I don't have any other announcements this morning, so praise team. Everybody please stand and join us.
Bible's the uh, book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, I had the opportunity this last weekend, uh, you know, later half of the week, to spend uh, a lot of time around a bunch of guys, right? And uh, and uh, we went out on a, on a trip, did a little camping, did a little, you know, four-wheeler riding, and but with a, with a central theme really to uh, take our sons who are you know either entering high school or in high school and start really pouring into them about what it means to be a man right and uh and because that's a tough time right i mean you're you're uh you're no longer a, a kid right you don't want to be a little kid doing little kid things but yet you don't really know how to to be a man just yet right and it's a it's a critical age i mean it's a it's a tough point that you are really struggling to define who you are and and what you believe in and and how you act and and you know who you want to be as a man and and as we were together you know talking about a lot of these things we talked about a lot of the defining characters of what makes a, a godly man a godly man and at the top of that list um and at the top of of my heart right now of what i want and desire for my sons uh, but i also want for my daughter and i also want for for all of you is biblical integrity right that as we talk about um you know all of the qualities that it took to to be a man integrity for me was at the top that if i can't trust you if we don't have a relationship where you know if you say something that that i can take your word for what it is if, if you're you know, going to lie to me, or you're going to say one thing but do something else, and there's no trust there, if there's no trust factor, then, then what do we have, right? We have nothing. And so integrity really fell into, um, for me, at the top of the list of things that I wanted to instill in my son to say, this is what's most important. 
right? That, that, that this is something that if you don't start here, if this isn't the foundation that you have, then, then nothing else matters, right? You can tell me all these great things, but if I don't trust you, if you don't have the integrity that I expect, then, then there's really nowhere for, for us to go. So when we looked at integrity, right, what, what is your integrity based upon? Because ultimately, integrity is an, is an action that's based on something. And, and integrity for me, when I look at being a biblical man, being your pastor, being your leader, right, that, that has to be uh, driven by doctrine. Right? And, and let me stop for a minute. I'll break down what doctrine is, because that's a church word right? that we use, that we use to, you know, people think of doctrine. Is it like a doctor? Is that, uh, what, what does that mean? Um, do doctrine really is, is what we believe in, you know, I mean, and, and why we believe in it. I mean, that, that when I look at the, the Bible, the Bible is telling us things, but, but doctrine is, is not an opinion. It's not a suggestion. It's truth from God, that if God says this is right, that it's right. And if he says this is wrong, this is wrong, right? My opinion doesn't matter. Whether I like it or not, doesn't matter. Whether or not my, my buddy tells me, oh, that's okay or not, that doesn't matter, right? Or whether or not I see another man who claims to be a, a godly man doing something or not, if the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. If the Bible says it's right, it's right, right? It's an immovable fact, a fact that, that becomes a reality that we know to be truth that is based on what God's word says to me, right? And then that leads, because of the power that's in that, leads to conviction in my heart that if I know that God says it's wrong, I should desire not to do it. And, and if I desire not to do it, but yet I do, right? Because I don't think that, that doctrine calls us to be sinless, I think we're all going to fail, but I think it should call us to sin, space, less, right? That I don't think anybody in here is perfect, right? I mean, I know my wife thinks I'm perfect sometimes, <laughs> but, you know, perfect for her. I'll, 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 I'll rephrase that. She knows I'm not perfect. And uh, she obviously sees more of my flaws than anybody else. But, but at the end of the day... Hopefully what she sees is that the doctrine in our life, the things that God's word teaches us, is going to drive me to try to sin less. It's going to lead to conviction in my heart, and conviction is going to drive that action and what I do, because what I do becomes who I am, right? I mean, how many people do you think of that you know them for their actions, right? I mean, I know that there are certain people that I can count on at any given time. There are people that if they tell me they're going to be there, they're going to be there. And if they tell me that I can rely on them for help, then they can rely on them. I know there are other people that they're going to tell me they're going to be there. Maybe they'll show up. Maybe they won't. You know, they, they, they tell me that they're there for me and that, that, I can, that I can rely on them for help. But it seems like every time I need help, they're always, you know, busy or they have something to do or they don't answer their phone or they don't respond to your text message. But if they need something, they're sure to text me. <laughs> You know, so, so you, who you are is driven by your convictions and what you believe, and that all flows through. So scripture is loaded with doctrine. It's loaded with things that are not suggestions, but are, are truths from God. And, and those things and how we live them out in our life and the love that we show for God really drives who we become. So that's the, the foundational point this morning about integrity being related to doctrine, the two are connected at the hip. That, that whatever your doctrine is, right, because I believe there are people that have doctrine, it's just not doctrine from the Word of God. <laughs> that it's the doctrine from the, the world that says what's convenient or what's easy or what's best for me, um, you know, leads to who they become. So in the scripture that we're going to read today in 2 Corinthians, I want to give you a bit of a background. We see here that this is Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. And this is a, a very straightforward set of verses um, that Paul is answering because he's being attacked. Right? He's being attacked because Paul, after the death of Jesus and the, the resurrection and the ascension into heaven, Paul's going out into the world at the direction of Jesus, and he's being obedient to what God's asking him to do and what Jesus is asking him to do. And he's 
purveying the church and planting churches all over the place. One of those was in Corinth. And, and as he goes out and continues to plant churches, there are other leaders who are moving in, and they're trying to persuade them that Paul is a false teacher and that Paul is, is not you know, who he says he is, and they're questioning Paul's character. right? That, and Paul had to defend himself. Paul had to come back, and this is very hard for Paul, because if you look at who Paul was, um, you know, Paul was somebody who had been through a lot. I mean, he had been beaten, he had been thrown in jail. I mean, you look at the, the countless times that he was tossed out of places for speaking the truth, and, and to talk about himself or to boast about himself, to have to defend himself, is not something that somebody who has a characteristic of being humble is good at, right? So Paul is having to defend himself here because these false teachers are coming in and that's what almost the entire book of second corinthians is about is about paul defending himself to that church saying you can't believe and follow what these teachers are teaching you folks this is absolutely critical in today's world when we look at who do we follow right i mean because there are a lot of false teachers out there in the world that are trying to tell you oh the Bible, you know, you can just ignore that part of it. If you don't like that part of the Bible, you can just ignore it. You don't have to follow that. Or this is, uh, you know, that's not really what it meant. You know, it didn't, when it said don't do this, it didn't really mean don't. It just meant that it's not, you know, maybe the best thing you could do. Paul was very real and very true in saying that God's word is God's word, and, and he worked to follow it in every aspect of his life. So they were questioning what it was that Paul was teaching because they knew that they couldn't question the truth. So let's read 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 15, and then we'll come back to it uh, a few times. All right, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 15. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf, that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. All right, let's pray before we get started this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for, Lord, being here with us today. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for the, the opportunity, Lord, that we had, Lord, this weekend to, to teach some of these young men and, Lord, to show them, Lord, the, the, the way that they should live through integrity. And Lord, I just pray that that integrity would, would flow through this church and Lord, that they would flow through each and every person in this, Lord, as we go out into the world to, to be your church. And Lord, that you would continue to strengthen us. Lord, that you would drive our, our conscience based on the doctrine. And Lord, that through that, Lord, that we would desire to, to sin less because we love you more. And Lord, that in everything we do, Lord, that you would be glorified. So, Paul was a, a very critical leader in the early church. I mean, if we look at the early church, um, Paul was responsible for a lot of the missionaries who were trained, a lot of the churches that were planted, a lot of what was going on in the early church and the explosive growth was based upon, upon Paul. And they were trying to challenge his leadership because there were others who saw the explosiveness and the, and the power that the church was gaining and how widely... The message was being spread. I mean, think, think about what happened, right? I mean, these are people who are first-person people who saw Jesus Christ, that they saw him in the flesh, they watched him teach, they watched him get crucified, and they watched him raise again on the third day. That, that the power that, that is encapsulated in that is, is absolutely crazy, and these people saw this as an opportunity. They saw the, the notoriety that Paul was gaining, and they believed that, that, that Paul was going to be a leader that would have power. So they were trying to move in and take that power. So he was a critical leader in the, in the early church. So let's pause for a minute and define what, what is a leader. 
I mean, what defines a, a leader today in, in earthly terms? I mean, if I look at leadership in the workplace, right, I, I look for things like courage, somebody who is, is bold, somebody who's willing to step out and to do the, the hard thing, somebody who has drive, they can't be lazy, um, they've got to be goal-oriented, they've got to be physically strong, right, they have the ability to, to persevere even when the times are tough. They have to be persuasive. They have to be able to, to mold opinions and to, to be able to, to get people to, to follow them. They have to have imagination, right? They have to be able to be creative and find ways to get things done when others couldn't. They have to be enthusiastic. They have to be excited. They have to, 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 to be, carry about them some, some mojo, right? That, that people say, wow, I want what that person has. Um, they have to be willing to take risks. I mean, if you look at Paul, Paul embodied all of these things, right? I mean, he, he was creative. You look at some of the ways that, that he talked to the different people groups, how he approached them in, in their way of thinking, and then, you know, would shift them to thinking other ways, and some of the, the creative ways that he did things. And, and he was driven, obviously. I mean, he was willing to do whatever it took, even if it meant getting beaten and thrown in jail. He got beaten and thrown in jail and persevered many times, which showed that he had physical strength. He, he was a, a leader that was persuasive and, and people followed him for a reason because he had the doctrine and he backed it up. But the one thing that he had that everything really was, was hinged upon was he had integrity. That, that he lived out what it is that he said he believed. Because without that, as we talked about earlier, do any of those things matter? That if somebody is a, is a great speaker and they're persuasive and they've got a lot of energy and they look the part and they're driven, but yet they're dishonest, can you follow that person? No. So integrity mattered, and that's what Paul was saying. So the, the definition of integrity is a quality of being undivided. Right of being true to one standard, being incorruptible. If there was anything that I could hope for our young men is that they would have these qualities, right? That they would know who they are. That they would know who they are based on the doctrine of God, that if God says it's wrong, it's wrong, and that they are undivided in their thought to know that, that if that's what God says, then it's what has to happen. And that anything outside of that is wrong. And when you know that and you own that, then you, you prescribe to, I'm going to be that, that's who I am, that they become then true to that standard, they become incorruptible, they become the opposite of hypocrisy, that honesty becomes a core part of who they are, and they, get, they become sincere in that process, that when they tell you they're going to pray for you, that means they're going to pray for you. When it tells you that they're empathetic to your situation, you know that it's not lip service, it's that they mean it, they feel it in their heart, because if they didn't, they wouldn't say it. You know, that, that being a, a man, being a man of God, it is tying everything back to the doctrine that I've, I've learned and that I've been taught since I was a child, becoming who I am. And that is what Paul had done here. That's how Paul was standing on his defense in what it is that he was saying to the church. Why? Because they couldn't attack the doctrine. They couldn't attack the truth. But church, that, the same thing is, is true today. Try to disprove that Jesus existed. Please, I beg you, if you don't believe that, that, that God created this earth, look at the complexity that's in the human body. Look at the complexity that's in this world. To think that just randomly two things collided and boom, the world was created, is that is far harder to believe than that there's a divine creator that with intelligence created this world. Okay? I mean, Sarah and I have this experiment that we do every day. Right? That uh, we have pillows on our bed. You guys have pillows on your bed? I'm not talking about the ones you sleep on. I'm talking about the pretty ones that have to go on in just a certain way after the bed's made. Right? There's one that goes on the left. There's one that goes on the right. But there's too big of a gap, so there's one that's like tall and skinny that has to go just right in the middle, up and down. Not too far back. Not too far forward. And then there's one that has to be, but they've got words on them, right? So they can't be upside down. They can't, you know, it's a square, right? So it could go, you know, like four different ways. It's got to go a certain way in a certain sequence. So 
I prescribe to, uh, I want to test the theory of chance. So I take all four <laughs> pillows every day and I just throw them at the bed, right? And I'm thinking maybe one day they'll all land just in the perfect spot. <laughs> You know how many times that's happened? Zero. And every day my wife's like, are we doing this again? Really? Is this what we're doing? And, and we, we laugh about it, you know, and we joke about it. But I say, this is insane to think that these are ever going to get here. How could I have an insanity of thought to think that for one instant that, that somehow that there are human bodies that can only vary by about eight degrees, that if your body temperature goes up, by four or five degrees, either way, you die. That you have to have food, you have to have water, you have to have oxygen, you have to have an atmosphere, you have to have an atmosphere that supports animals that grow to feed us and plants that grow to feed them and to feed us. That all these things have to happen, that the fragility of life is such that if any one of those things gets out of whack, we all die. And to think that that ecosystem just came to chance by randomness happen is absolutely insane to me. So that no matter what they did, these people knew that they could not attack the doctrine. The other part is they saw Jesus firsthand. They knew that what Paul was teaching was right. They knew that what Paul was saying was accurate. They knew that they could not disprove the doctrine. Folks, I challenge anybody today to, to look through any historical record book and deny that Jesus Christ existed. And deny that he was here. The Bible is the most backed factual piece of historical evidence with more copies. You know, Homer's Iliad, there are like four copies in existence, right? The Bible, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands that they found, and guess what? They all match, right? That they have the, the, the worldly, you know, integrity to say that, that it is accurate, it is written, that it is God's word empowered, empowering men to write, to give us doctrine to know how to live our life. They knew they couldn't attack that. So what did they have to do? They had to attack his character, right? They had to attack who he was, saying that, oh, well, he's, he's not the leader. He shouldn't be the leader because he's not the right person. And Paul was having to defend that, and that's why he responded the way that he did. And folks, if you claim to be a believer in Christ, expect that people are going to look at you differently and put you under a microscope. That the minute you put that word Christian on your back, you're going to come under attack, and people are going to say, Every little thing you do wrong, what are they going to say? It, it happened this weekend, right? I mean, we, we joke about it, but there were, you know, you know there's a, a saying, right? That there are times that maybe I, I, uh, I push the limits of, of uh, being funny versus being doctrinally sound. And they, they remind me to say, um, <clears throat> you're a pastor? You know, and, and I say, I, I am. And, and I need to be mindful of what I say and who I say it in front of, right? That, that um, of what I say. And, and so I expect that I'm going to be looked at differently because when people find out I'm a pastor, um, it's funny. They're like, you didn't tell me that guy was a pastor. I wouldn't have said those things, <laughs> you know, and, and be, because I think that they, they expect that, right? That if you are a Christian or a believer, people will not say things in front of you. They will not act certain ways. Why? Because they expect you to be different. But if you act those ways, then what happens? They're going to say, oh, well, he, he's no different. And do I really want what he's got? Right? That the part of being a man is standing on what you believe in, whether it's popular or not. So they were working to convince others that Paul was a fraud, a liar, he, he was a, a hypocrite. And, and this is what he's delivering in the, in the passage, is his response to them, to having to defend himself. And he knew that if they were successful in questioning his integrity then he couldn't lead the church and the church wouldn't continue to grow in the right direction in God's direction because they were going to take it in the direction of the world to get personal gain. Okay? Can anybody think of any churches that have gone in the direction of meeting their personal gain? Yeah, folks, I'm going to tell you right now, any pastor that tells you he needs a private jet and four airplanes and a mansion, um, that, that's going the wrong way. Okay? I don't have a personal jet in case anybody wants to know. But uh, that shouldn't be 
what's driving it, but Paul knew that it would take things into a corrupted way. So Paul responds, and this is how he responds. Let's, let's dissect it a bit. The first thing that I noticed when I read this, I highlighted some words here in orange. What do we see that Paul's saying here? I mean, ultimately at the core of, of, of a leader should be humility, right? If Paul's defending himself, he doesn't say, I, 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 I did this. Look what I did. Look where I've achieved. Look what's happened by my leadership. I see a lot of we and your. And the only time that he says the word I, what is he saying? He said that I also trust that it's in your conscience, right? So he's saying that, that I personally am, am, am trusting that, that you, because I know you, that your conscience is being acted out in your life. So what does he say here? He says, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, right? We, we, we talked about this, I mean, you know, a couple weeks ago, that, that a lot of times pastors will talk about the love of God. And God is a loving God. He loves us so much that he, he sent his son. But Paul is recognizing here, what? The terror of the Lord. How many times do we talk about the terror of the Lord? Folks, read the Old Testament. I mean, you know, God is a jealous God. He wants your attention. He wants you to love him. That's why it's his greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is love me. That's why he gives us free will. He gives us the, he loves us so much that he's going to let us at our own demise make mistakes. He has the ability to stop us. He has the ability to prevent us from making poor decisions. But in the end, he wants us to love us. Why? Because Love him because we love him. Not because he forces us to love him. It has to be our choice with free will. Right? So he knows that. And therefore he loves us that much. So he is talking about the terror of the Lord is such that, that, that he is a jealous God. And he knows that and recognizes that. That's where he starts. He says, and that we persuade men, but we are also known to God. So he's saying that, that we persuade men to say, do you know who Jesus Christ was? Do you know that he died on the cross for you? Do you know that he loves you? And so much so that he wants you to love him. And if you do, that means that you're going to have an eternity in heaven. That, that he says, we persuade men of this, but also knowing that the terror of the Lord, that the opposite of that is that if we don't, that, that we suffer an eternity in, in hell, separated from God in a place that has burning and gnashing of teeth. That that is a reality. Right? But he says also, we are well known to God. He's saying that, that even though we persuade men of these things, we are accountable to who? Church, I'm not accountable. I am accountable to you. But who am I accountable to first? To God. And he knows everything. <laughs> you know, I may verbalize something and somebody says, Todd, you're a pastor. But they don't know the 50 things that came in my head that never came out. <laughs> Right? God knows all those things. And it says, first off, I'm accountable to him. Right? And he says, and then he goes on to say, and also I trust you are well known in your conscience. That, that he's saying that if you don't think that God hears these things, God hears them and you ought to be ashamed and you ought to know who you are. That I trust you're keeping that in check and you're working to work on that. So he's, he's starting this off, his defense of himself by really talking about the doctrine and the basis in which the, 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 that his character, that his integrity is formed upon. It's formed upon first and foremost that I know that God is all-powerful, almighty, that he created this earth, and that without him I'm nothing, and that's why I have a conscience, because the doctrine that I have has created in me a conscience that says if the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. And because of that, I know that I'm accountable to God, and I hope that you also understand that you're accountable to God, right? Because he said, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but he's saying, so I'm not sitting here saying, look how great I am, look how perfect I am, but he's saying that that's to God. He says, I'm not doing it because I want you to praise me, he says, but that you give an opportunity to boast on our behalf. So what? I hope, as a pastor, that you can say, is to say, hey, I, I work to say that I want to be a man of integrity, right? That, that as your pastor, that if I was dishonest or if I was 
a liar, if I cheated on things, or if I did things wrong, would you invite somebody to come here? I mean, no, you'd be like, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know if I should be going there, right? I don't know if, how am I going to invite somebody? Paul's saying that here. He's saying that because I don't do these things to, to make you happy, but I do these things so that you can boast about them to others to say you should believe in God. And by the way, look at my bro Paul over here. Look what he's doing. Look how he's living his life. And he's got it figured out. Why? Because he's put his faith and trust in God. And he's living out what God is, is doing in his life. And he's living out that doctrine in his life. Because of that, he has integrity. And because of that, you should follow him. Right? Church, when you're a believer in Christ, you, you have that same responsibility and that same power. Right? That, that you have the ability to drive people away from Christ by the way you live your life. And you'll be accountable to that one day to God. That if you claim to be a Christian, if you claim to be a believer in Christ but yet you don't act that way, and, and you go out into the world and do worldly things, but yet claim to be that, you can't boast about the, the integrity that you have and what you say you believe. And therefore, when people get turned away, that's on you. That's on your conscience. That's on your relationship with God. And Paul's saying that here, saying, look, I'm not going to defend myself. I'm not going to boast about myself. I'm going to leave it to you guys to boast about me because you've seen who I am. You know who I am. You know me. Therefore, you, you're all I need. That I don't have to defend myself. You can do it for me. Why? Because you had integrity. You can only say that if you have integrity. Right? But if you didn't have the integrity, you can't make that claim. So Paul was in a position to defend himself. And we see it goes on and says, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. So he's saying here that, that if, if my doctrine, which the doctrine that is, that is critical, that I'm first accountable to God and then I'm accountable to man. And he's saying, but if I pass that accountability to God, then, then the result of that will benefit man. But I don't do it for men, I do it for God, right? I do it for the right reasons. How many pastors do we, do we see the, you know, the, the TV evangelists get the bad rap, right? That, that you know, you, you look at what they're doing and you don't believe what they're saying because you believe they're doing it for men, not for God, right? They're doing it to gain popularity, to gain ratings, to gain views. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just glad I'm never in that position, right? To be tempted with that power because I always want to be accountable to God and God alone and nobody else. And, and if people like it, they, they like it. If they don't, they don't. I'm going to preach God's word. I'm going to preach the doctrine. And Paul's reaffirming that here to say, I, I'm doing what I do for God, not for anybody else. An, an example to be seen. That is what the church should be. That's what you as a believer should be, is an example to be seen. And that's what Paul is saying here. And then he goes into the why. That I'm an example to be seen. Why? Why do I do these things? Why do I live the life? Why do I focus on having integrity and being doctrinally sound and, and, and being accountable to follow that doctrine? Because for the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Church, this is the foundation of what Jesus said, right? What is the first and greatest commandment? To love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Why? Because Jesus Christ died for your sin, and that without him, you, you suffer the wrath of the, the, the penalty of punishment for your sin. It's, it's the only way out. It's the only solution. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That without him, we have nothing. And that if we believe that, if we believe that that is the only way, then that belief in him and that doctrine that he gives should drive us to be accountable to follow those things. And that should drive our conscience. And like here in Paul, what I desire for all of our men is that they have the character that, that others look at them and say that they have the integrity of Christ. 
They have the integrity of Christ living in their life, and it shows. It's not just something they speak, it's who they are. But that extends to this church as well. It extends to the, the Christian faith of those who claim to be believers of Christ, that, that, that what Jesus Christ did for us should drive us. We should be driven, we should be motivated, we should be grateful every single day for every opportunity we have. Why? Because without him, we would be lost. Without him, there would be no hope. Without him, there is nothing. And because of that, I have gratitude in my heart. So I ask a few questions this morning. Right? Paul had a leg to stand on. Paul had the ability to defend himself. Do you have the ability to defend yourself this morning? I mean, if somebody questioned your integrity as a believer in Christ, do you have the ability to defend yourself? Does your appearance match your heart? Because we started off by talking about doctrine and saying that, that doctrine flows into, should drive actions. Those actions become who we are. So who we are is fueled by the doctrine in our life. If we claim that the doctrine is this Bible, Jesus Christ, and what he did for us, then our lives should reflect that. Our lives should reflect an obedience to what he did for me. So I'm going to ask you, does your life reflect your heart? Do people see on the outside what you claim to have on the inside? Next question, does your doctrine define who you are? Because if your doctrine as the Bible as a whole doesn't define who you are, if you're picking and choosing the things that you believe and you're picking and choosing, you know, what things that, that you're going to support and not support, it's not, it's not a menu, right? You don't get to choose, well, I'll take this and this, but no, I'll pass on that. It's all or, or nothing. Does it define who you are? Or do the things of this world define who you are? Does the integrity of this doctrine get lived out in our lives? Right? That if we claim to believe that, is it something that's evident in how we live our lives? Because that integrity defines how we can lead. I mean, as believers, as young men standing out in your community, standing out amongst those of your peers in your high school or in, in your workplace as you enter the workplace or whatever that is, that if, if that integrity uh, of who you are based on what you believe isn't lived out in your life, then there's no way that you can lead someone to Christ. There's no way that you can be fruitful, right? We talked about that last week, that, that a good tree produces fruit, that if it doesn't produce fruit, then it's not a tree. Right? And, and you have to, to produce fruit. Our goal, our desire, should be to further the kingdom of God. That should be what our focus is about. That's what Paul was doing here, was working to expand the kingdom of God. How can we lead? How can we lead as a church? How can we lead as individuals if we don't have the integrity first as the foundation in which that we have to build that upon? But if you do those things, you should expect to be attacked. That people are going to put you under a microscope. And they are going to look to pick you apart. But ultimately what drives us, what drives us to seek to not be sinless, but to sin less, is, is what Jesus Christ did for us. So ultimately I, I ask you this morning the question, uh, does your appearance match your heart? Is it being driven by the gratitude that you have for what Jesus Christ did for you? If it does, act like it. You know, the, the comment came out of my mouth this week, uh, this weekend a few times. Be a man. You know, that, that it's time for you to stop being a boy and to stop thinking like a, like a selfish child and start thinking like a man and learn how to be selfless, learn how to be humble, learn how to, how to build others up instead of tearing each other down. You know, I mean, as guys, like, we like to joke around a lot, right? You know, but, but in the background of joking around, I was constantly pouring into these young men and telling them, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for who you are. I'm praying for who you're going to marry one day. I'm praying for, for what you're going to become and, and the godly example that you have the ability to set 
in your amongst your friend group and, and in your community in your workplace and, and and encouraging them to encourage their friends right that as men we like to puff up and oh one person you know we were shooting clay pigeons and you know one person got up there and you know knocked out six out of six and he's all you know ah. the next guy comes up and he can't hit the side of a barn literally because there was a barn there <laughs> and uh and uh and you know feeling down on himself and i'm like go go encourage him right because everybody's a good day everybody's a bad day and yeah there's these 14 guys standing back there all you know heckling little hens back there you know giving each other a hard time but in the midst of that creates an opportunity for one of them to step up out of the crowd and to go over and take that person by the arm and say, man, I had a bad day yesterday. Today's your day. Tomorrow will be my day again. You know, let's just get back on the horse. You're doing great. You have the opportunity to pour into people and provide positivity. Is that how you're going to live out your life? Does your, because that's what Jesus does for us. How many times have I sinned? How many times have I failed over and over and over again? And every time I go to him and I say, God, forgive me. And he says, boom, done. It's forgiven. That if I'm going to live out a life of Jesus Christ, then who am I not to encourage and to love others and to give that same thing to them? Is that a fuel in our life? Are we living that out or is it just something we say? That's what I want us to get. That's what I want us to hear out of what Paul is saying here is that if I have that integrity to stand on, nobody can question me because they can't argue with who Jesus Christ was. So church, have the integrity this morning. Young men, have the integrity to stand on based on how you live your life because then there's nothing that they can take from you because you know that you process what you profess that you can have security knowing where you're going you have security knowing that your salvation is at hand because of how you behave with what you believe and how you live out that doctrine in your life the obedience you have generates this reciprocal love with god that can't be matched anywhere else that anything else you seek in this world, anything else you look to gain, any other happiness you look to find somewhere else can never be achieved except for knowing that your creator and you are in sync with that love. If you're grateful for what Jesus Christ did for you this morning, church, the charge this morning is act like it. I challenge you to let your conscience speak to you this morning and determine, are you living that out of your life? Or is it just something you say? Grace team, why don't you come
with you this morning and uh, you know excited for what God's got to, to unfold in the upcoming weeks and uh, excited for uh, the opportunities you're going to get. The opportunities you're going to get to be the example and to live out through integrity what it is that, that God has. So um, appreciate everybody being here this morning and uh, excited for, for what God's going to do in these young men as uh, we continue to, to build into them. I know that uh, as a reminder, as we are not doing an, an altar call right now, if you ever have a question or your, your conscience is, is at a point that you want to reach out and talk, my phone is always on. Um, you know, send me a text message because I know you know we don't get good service at our house. But, uh, you know, reach out. I'll, I'll stop everything I'm doing and I'll call you. Why? Because there's nothing more important than you recognizing that moment when your conscience is speaking to you and acting on it. Why? Because if you suppress that long enough, it'll, it'll eventually stop calling. Right? So if, if Jesus is, is on your mind, if there's something going on, that, that needs addressed in your life. Your conscience is speaking to you today. Don't don't hesitate to, to seize that moment. Pick up the phone, call, stop by, swing by, whatever that is. All right, we're here for you. All right, we love you, church, and uh, excited to to be here with you this week. All right, brother Russ, why don't you dismiss us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy, Lord. We just thank you that we can gather together today, Lord, with all of us here that just love you so much, Lord. And we just want to give you the praise and the glory that you deserve, Lord. I just thank you for the men of this church, for their just their leadership and their, their guidance and their direction, their love for each other, their concern for each other, but most of all, their love for you, Father. Give us the wisdom to just teach the men that are younger than us, Lord, and even teach ourselves, Lord, because uh, we're never too old to learn. And I just pray that you would just bless us, guide us, direct us, help us to be leaders of this community, of this church house, uh, of our job site, where we work at, uh, just wherever that we may be, Lord. May we be a blessing unto you that people may see that in us and ask us that why that we're just so happy and that we're just so, uh, we're not worried about anything, Lord, because we know that you're in control of all things. Just give us that strength and that encouragement, Lord. And as always, we thank you mostly for your son, who just loved us so much that he gave his life for us on that cross, Lord. And these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.